If you have your Bible this morning, if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. We're in a series called OT, Old Testament. And last week, our pastor preached on what character in the Old Testament? Daniel. Good. The students were right there with me. I like you students being fired up right here in the front row. Amen. So we preached, our pastor preached on what character in the Old Testament? Daniel. Very good. You're really soft this morning. Daniel. And what characteristic of Daniel did our pastor highlight? Courage. Absolutely. Daniel had courage. You think about it. Daniel goes to the lion's den to fight all those hungry lions, okay, if you will. And he had courage to go. But the thing that drove his courage was this. Because he didn't just have courage to go in there and fight lions. He had to have courage in something. He had courage in his dependence in the Lord. He was dependent on God, which gave him courage to do what only the Lord could do through him. And that's do all what Daniel did. One is to whip those lions, if you will. Today, we're going to look at a character in the Old Testament, Elijah, who had a lot of dependence on the Lord. A lot of dependence on the Lord. Reminds me of a story. I, I grew up here in Cleveland, Tennessee, Bradley County. And uh, I, have a, I had a grandmother that lived on the south end of Bradley County, down there near Bishop's Bakery. Does anybody know where Bishop's Bakery is? Coach Clark knows where Bishop's Bakery is. My grandmother, Nanny, who lived right across the street from Bishop's Bakery, grew up, raised in Polk County, Steve Morgan, raised in Polk County, went to south end of Bradley County, then moved in, and later in her life, she died when she was 94, I believe, later life at, down there at Bishop's Bakery. And I loved to go to her house uh, on the weekends. And one of the reasons I loved to go to her house on the weekends, she made the greatest cornbread of all time. Oh, my stars. I loved her cornbread. And I loved the smell of Bishop's Baker across the street. And at night, when we'd go to bed and she would pray, I loved listening to the train go down the tracks down there in the south end of town. It kind of would put me sleep of the night. Some, who, who under, who's been there in the south end of town understands what I'm saying? Raise your hand. Amen. I see those hands. Bots understands what I'm talking about. My grandmother, Nanny, was four foot eight. Four foot eight. She had 12 children. 12 children. Outlived them all but two. Outlived them all two. She's four foot eight. And she's tell those stories when she was growing up. She, she picked cotton when she was young. And she said, I was, such, I was so small I could get eyeball to eyeball with those cotton balls and pick them. Great lady. And when I would go to her house, she would have her Bible open. But she couldn't read. And I'd sit on the front porch eating cornbread and milk. Y'all had cornbread and milk. Some, I like cornbread and sweet milk. Some people like cornbread. Jeff, you like cornbread and sweet milk? Some people like cornbread and buttermilk. I got to have a lot more sweetness in me, so I like cornbread and sweet milk. So I used to sit on the front porch, have pinto beans, and have cornbread and milk. It was just unbelievable. And she would tell me stories. And I asked her one day, I said, Nan, help me understand this. You have 12 children, outlived them all but two. You had multiple husbands, never got a divorce. And she had to bury them all. Pretty tough woman. It's not a woman necessarily some of these men would want to marry, but it's a pretty tough woman, amen? <laughs> Great lady. I said, Nanny, let me ask you a question. How'd you make it through all those tough times? The depression, picking cotton, Bearing your children, husbands, how do you make it? And she just looked at me like I was crazy for asking that question. She said, well, honey, I made it because of the Lord. The Lord's strength got me through it. And I just totally depend on Jesus. That's a novel idea, isn't it? She just totally depended on the Lord and got her through all those hard times. Today, we're going to look at five snapshots of, the, of Elijah in 1 Kings, starting verse, in, in chapter 17, on how we can learn how to have dependence in the Lord through the life of Elijah, okay? So if you have your Bible, 
You might want to take notes today. You might have, you know, get your iPhone out or a piece of paper, lipstick, mascara, pen. What I don't care what you do. You might want to take some notes and we might learn how to have dependence in the Lord. Okay. First Kings chapter 17. Elijah, the first snapshot, Elijah did what the Lord wanted him to. Elijah did what the Lord said. Let's get the picture. Here you have the king. Does anybody know who the king there at, at, at that time, the children of Israel, was who what? Does anybody know? A what? Ahab. And he had a wife named Jezebel. In the southern ter- de- dialect, it was Jezebel. It, Jezebel, okay? And they worshiped the, the, the idol Baal, okay? And Jezebel was a big fan of Baal. And so here you have Elijah coming on the scene, coming out of the mountains, and he's a little bit like John the Baptist, kind of rough, kind of a prophet, going to proclaim the word of the Lord, okay? So he goes in front of the king to, t- to challenge him on his worshiping Baal. All right, can you imagine? Here you are, man, and you have the courage to appear before the king to tell him he's messed up. Well, the the flesh part of me would say I'd be a nervous wreck because I would be scared what the king would do to me. Not just the king, what would Jezebel do to me? Because they were all into Baal. But the spirit part of Elijah says, man, I want to do what God wanted me to do and tell them they don't need to be worshiping Baal. They need to be worshiping the Lord. So he appears before the king and says, hey, if you don't change who you're worshiping, you're going to have a drought. And not just any drought. You're going to have such a drought, even the dew will not, not, we won't have any dew. So you'll have no water. So all of a sudden, Elijah shares that. And look at verse three. Look at verse three. This will bless your heart. Verse three of chapter 17. The Lord tells Elijah to do what? To go and hide. Would that be bless your heart when the, when the Lord tells you, to, when God tells you to go hide? You've done, you, you did what God wanted you to do. You've proclaimed the word of the Lord. You're going to have a drought. Quit worshiping Baal. And he tells you, coach, go hide. Why am I going to go hide? Here's why. Don't you hear this? Proclaiming the word of the Lord or taking a stand for God is not always popular. Hello? In our culture, a lot of times we decide, hey, we want everybody to like us. We don't want to be unpopular. We want to be the cool kids. We want everybody to get along. We want everybody to say, hey, know who we are. We got all, we got the Instagram posts. We got the Facebook posts. Look at our, we're just perfect. And why would I want to say something that somebody not like me? That's where Elijah was. Hey, quit worshiping Baal. You're going to have a drought and it's going to be a bad one. And then the God says, go high, go down by the brook to be away from the king. And I want to provide for you. It's an interesting thing. When we do what the Lord wants us to do, how much he provides for us. We got by the brook. And you know what? The interesting thing is I learned from a bird watcher, the second, the first service, got by the brook and a raven was supposed to feed Elijah by the brook. And then he was supposed to drink the water from the brook. And so by day and night, the raven came and fed Elijah, provided for Elijah because he met his need because Elijah proved that I wanted to be dependent on the Lord. And then he drank, if you will, from the brook. The bird watcher told me the reason that he thought that God chose the raven was the raven was one of the smartest birds in the bird world. Go figure that God would know something like that. You know, you read this story in 1 Kings 17. You know what God's doing with Elijah? He's teaching Elijah. He's building his confidence in the first snapshot that, that we look at today to go to the third snapshot to Mount Carmel. 
So he's building confidence. If you do what I say and depend on me, I want to fall through. So all of a sudden, the drought got so bad, it, the, the brook drew, uh, there was no more water. And so God says for him to go, in first, second snapshot, to go to Zarephath. So he goes in 1 Kings 17, 18, 8 through 24, he, the Lord sends Elijah to Zarephath. Now, I asked Dr. E, where in the world was Zarephath in the, in, in, the, in the map? And we couldn't find it. It must have been a small town. So all of a sudden, he says to go to Zarephath, and there's going to be a widow there that's going to take care of you and feed you. So can you imagine, here this guy, he's, he's, he did what the Lord wanted him to do with the king, and, he, and he, the bird fed him, the raven fed him, and the brook uh, let him have some water. The brook dries up, he says to go to Zarephath. So he goes to Zarephath to find a widow. Now can you imagine, and he said he walks in the city, and there's a lady picking up sticks. Just so happens that would be the widow lady that God, that God led him to. He looks at the widow lady and says, hey, ma'am, I need some food. And the widow says, well, I only have food for the day for me and my child. He said, ma'am, if you do this, God's going to provide for us. If you'll go fix me a cake for me and you and your little child, God will provide unlimited food. And then if you'll go get us some oil to drink in that vat, that it will be unlimited food and drink until God brings the end to the drought. So the lady goes, makes the bread, and she starts having more than you can imagine. She gets the oil and it's unlimited. Now let me ask you a question. Here you're starting to build a testimony. What God did is in Elijah at the brook, then what God's doing with Elijah and whom else? The widow and the young man. What kind, of, what kind of example is it starting to be what God's doing through Elijah now with the widow and the little boy? So a little while goes by and the little boy dies. And the widow Looks at Elijah and said, what is God doing to me for my sins? I knew, I knew that I was going to get, I'm going to have to pay for my sin, what I've done in the past. And so Elijah takes the little boy upstairs. He lays him on the bed and starts, lays on him three times and starts crying out to God, please heal this little boy. He's praying for this little boy. And here again, God comes through and heals the little boy. Elijah's total dependence. God, do something. I, I got to have some food. The raven, the brook. I go to the city. I don't have any food. The widow says, I don't have any food. I'm out today. God provides again. Unlimited bread. Unlimited oil. The little boy dies. God, I can't do anything. What am I going to do? Elijah's praying for the little boy. God heals the little boy. The little boy and Elijah come downstairs. Look there in verse 24 of chapter 17. Look. Let this be said of us. Now I know. Now I know that you are a man of God. Now I know that you're a man of God. Can that be said of you? Are you living on mission with the Lord so much? Students, are you living on mission with the Lord so much that the people around you say, man, she's a woman of God. She's a man of God. Adults, do your students see you as a person that is so dependent on the Lord to come through that if, it, if God, if you don't come through, I'm hiding from the king. If you don't come through, I'm, in, I'm dead. 
But are we so concerned about being popular? Are we so concerned about, hey, I, I don't want to, I want to be recognized as a believer, but honestly, I really don't want to be recognized. That leads us to the third snapshot. See, the Lord's building his life here, if you will, his testimony here through Elijah and, and his teaching Elijah to have more and more dependence on God. So they go up on Mount Carmel and you have the king, Ahab, and he gathers 450 prophets of Baal. We're fixing to have a showdown on Carmel. Right? So they get up on the mountainside and they gather 450 prophets of Baal and they set out a big uh, 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 altar there with a bull on it. And they over here... Elijah sets out an altar with 12 stones with a trench around it and a bull on top of it. And then we're going to say, who is God? You know, one of the neatest, interesting scriptures when you talk about that is, is in 1 Kings 18, verse 21. Get the picture. Elijah's coming up on the mountain. Altar, altar, 450 prophets of Baal walk, marching around this altar. And Elijah approaches all the people in verse 21 and said, how long will you be tripping over two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Let me ask you a question. How long are you going to quit? How long are you going to keep tripping over opinions, folks? Who you worship? What are you worshiping today? The problem in our culture is we all, many of us say we want to be Christians, but it's a secondary God. It's not a primary God. Our primary God, many of us, man, in today's world, man, man, we're a heck of an athlete. Boy, we can play. Man, we're good. We, we, we are all whatever, all Bradley County, all whatever. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with athletics. I mean, my kids, and we all played. There's nothing wrong with those things. But at the end of the day, my concern is this. That's become our God, if you will. That's our primary focus. We'll worship Jesus when it's convenient. Hey, we don't want to look like we're fanatical or anything. I don't hate to tell you, Elijah looked pretty fanatical up there, didn't he? He's on Mount Carmel by himself. He got the children of Israel watching. He got the prophets of Baal watching. He's got the king who he's scared of watching, and he's by himself. But you know what? Hey, hey, watch it. He's not by himself because you know who's with him? The Lord's with him. And me and the Lord, I think it's pretty much, it's a majority. But what happens is, he, he, it's kind of funny. He said, what, you're tripping between two opinions? What God are you worshiping in front of Jesus today? Your health? Well, I figured out pretty quick, like that'll, that'll mess up. Your education? There's nothing wrong with being educated. I, I tried to go as long as I could, only by the grace of my wife helping me. You know, there's nothing wrong with education. But my, my concern is this, guys, listen, this. parents, sometimes we let travel ball be our God. Well, you stepping on some toes now. Don't be stepping on no toes. I can't tell me. I had a coach one time, this little side note, this is, first, this is the only service I shared this. I had a coach one time tell my son, Riley, said, you're never going to play college sports. He said, because you're not going to do this camp. Well, we feel like we're going to go to youth camp. No, you need to go to our camp. Because that'll help you play college sports. And you know what? By the grace of Rachel said, we went to youth camp that year. And you know what? He ended up playing college sports. is okay. And if he didn't, it's okay too. Hello? Because parents, at some point in time, you're going to have to be the parent. 
And so let everybody else be the parent. Does that make sense? Because your kids are waiting for somebody to say, who's God in your life? Either Jesus or that athletic field. Or Jesus in that band. I ain't going to go off that either. Or Jesus in that academic. There's, but listen to me. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's not primary. It's not the Lord. And unfortunately, in our society, we've made it the Lord. You know what it says? Our country, we're, we're messed up right now. If you turn on the news, or well, Russia's attacking, attacking Yugoslavia, the Chinese are attacking Thailand, we have, uh, 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 we've got uh, interest, uh, interest rates going off the roof, we know food, we got COVID, we got this, and you know what? The Republicans are going to fix it. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be our God either. Or the Democrats. I'm an equal opportunity employee. But unfortunately, get this, guys. Listen, we got to quit tripping over two opinions. And we've got to make our mind up that this is, he's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. Because what happened on that mountain was, he was a building process. It was, Elijah was by himself and God did a work. Say, you do what I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. With a widow and the little boy, you do what I say, you're going to be a testimony. I'm going to bless you. Now you get up on Mount Carmel, you do what I say to 400, 500, 600,000 people. You know, you do what I say, you feel alone. Watch me do my work. It's kind of interesting when you, this over here, those 450 prophets of Baal, Nothing was happening. He said, I, Elijah said, I guess your God's asleep. Poke him a little bit. All of a sudden we get over here and they douse with Elijah, builds an altar, trench, douses it three times with water so nothing can happen. It has to be a miracle. And all of a sudden, boom. What kind of testimony was it for the people that were watching that day? Who's God? Because you had one man showing, I'm going to do what God says. Be totally dependent on him. And you know what? He falls through. Let's go to the next snapshot. Snapshot number four. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. Elijah goes up to Mount Sinai. He goes up the mountain because he wants to get some, he wants to get some more coaching from the Lord. God, tell me my next assignment. Asher, tell me my next plan for me. So he goes up on the mountainside by himself to get a word from the Lord. And all of a sudden, here comes an earthquake. Boom. Here comes lightning, fire, all this noise, all this noise. And listen, 1 Kings 19, verse 12. Look at this, this. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a voice. And listen how the Lord spoke to Elijah on Sinai. He spoke to him in a soft whisper. In a soft whisper. Listen to this. I want you to hear this. What has to stop in your life for you to hear God's voice? What noise has to stop in your life for you to hear instructions from the Lord? My concern is this. We have filled our life with so much noise we can't hear him. We hear the noise. So how can I be dependent on a God I can't even hear because of all the noise? And so on Sinai, the Lord speaks to Elijah in a soft, soft 
whisper. How noisy is your life today? It's hard to be dependent. I'm speaking to Jeff Lovingood here too. It's hard for Jeff Lovingood to be dependent on the Lord when I can't hear the instructions from God. So I have to evaluate my life. Jeff, what do I have to do to develop dependence in the Lord today? Right? What do I need to do? What are some action steps? What are some action steps for Jeff Love and Good West that I need to take to, to develop dependence in the Lord? I'll give you six right now. Get your pencil out, paper, lipstick, mascara, phone, iPhone. Here's your game plan, okay? Six action steps on how to develop dependence on the Lord. One is this. Number one, recognize my limitations. I can't, but he can. I can't, he can. My, our, my deal is this. Too many things we can, we can, we can. I don't need. Less a Jeff. See, the deal, we desire, we desire our, for our heart to go larger for the Lord. And as it grows larger for the Lord's students, it goes larger for people. Because God desires for us to love him with our heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and our neighbor as what? Ourselves. So as my heart grows larger for the Lord, it goes larger for people. That shows, hey, I'm dependent on the Lord because my heart can't go larger for the Lord if I don't hear him and I don't know him. It's all about self. I love the Grinch. Have you ever watched the Grinch for Christmas? Love the Grinch. I saw that hand. The Grinch for Christmas. And you watch his love go, goes, his heart grows bigger for the little, little, what's her name? Hoo hoo. What's her name? What's her name? Cindy Lou Who, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's it. You got it? And you remember his heart goes like this, boom, 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 bing. Why? Because he loved the people. That's what God wants to do in our lives. Listen, what happens is this. God desires for our heart to go larger for him. And as it does, it goes larger for people, not just self. We got the self thing down. All right, next, next Action step. Start my day intentionally surrendering to him. Empty, empty me of self asking the spirit to fill me. Don't empty yourself and fill yourself back up with you. Hello? Fill it back up with the spirit that wants to be resonating through you. All right, number three. Turn, hey, this is a good one. Greg, you need to write this down. Turn up the Holy Spirit's volume. Turn it up. Turn down the world's volume. I can hear him better. Turn up the Holy Spirit volume. Turn down the world's volume. The problem is we turn up the world's volume, the world's volume, the world's volume, and it's so noisy we can't hear the Spirit. That's why it's so noisy, okay? Number four, dependence is about relying on Jesus, not the miracles. That's, that's, Batterson does this series about that. As we go around and we're looking, we're looking for the miracles instead of Jesus. Though, don't look for the miracles. Look for Jesus. He's the one that causes the miracles. It's unbelievable what happens when you look for the Lord. Number five, ask for dependence. Ask for it. You have not because you ask not. Elijah asked for bold, a bold request because he realized he needed God even more. He needed God even more. And number six, Take time with the Lord, spending time in his presence so you can recognize his voice better. One of the reasons you can't hear him 
is because you don't know him. You've walked an aisle, filled a car, been baptized, and you really don't know Jesus. So how can I hear him if I don't know him? And some of us got so much noise and we're worshiping all this stuff, we ain't trying to hear him. But he's speaking. Just like on Mount Sinai with Elijah, he's speaking. Maybe in a voice, soft voice. The last snapshot is one of my favorites. And it's found there in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. It's one of my favorites. Elijah comes off Sinai. He spends some time with a guy named Elisha. He invested him. He coaches him, teaches disciples him, Miss Linda. And Elijah's getting ready to go to be with the Lord in heaven. God's getting ready to take him up. And Elijah looks at Elisha and says this. Students, look here. Says this. Elijah says, what can I give you, Elisha? And Elisha says this, dads, listen here. Elisha says, I want double the spirit that's in you, Elijah. I want double of the spirit that's in you. Because I've seen your dependence. You have followed the Lord. Your testimony has been un but it's been unbelievable only by the grace of God. And I want to double the spirit that's in you. Parents, will your kids say that? Or will they say, hey man, you've taught me a lot of good things, but spiritual things have kind of been on the shelf. At the end of the day, folks, listen to me. At the end of the day, we got to quit tripping over two opinions. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. What is he in your life? This past April, many of you know this, I had a heart attack. They didn't give me much of a chance to live, about 30%. And so as I was being taken to the operating room, which they gave me a 30% chance to live, Rachel was holding my hand. Lauren, we were just going to surgery. And I'll never forget letting my wife's hand go. And when I let my wife's hand go, I'm thinking, in my mind, I'm thinking, this will be the last, might be the last time I see her on this earth. I'll see her in heaven in a minute, but it'll be the last time I see her on earth. And so I let my wife's hand go. And we're going to the operating room. And I want you to hear this. I had great that passes all understanding because my dependence was in Jesus. There's a lot of uneasiness going on in our world today. A lot of fear. And the reason is, I believe we're putting our trust our faith, our dependence, and a lot of stuff. And Jesus is sitting there saying, I'm talking to you. You can't hear me because of the noise. I'm talking to you. You can't hear me because you don't know my voice. 
I'm talking to you. If you would just listen to me, I want to do a great work in your life. The peace that passes all understanding. The question is this. Why not? Why wouldn't you make the decision to trust in the Lord, to give Him your life, and then depend on Him? 